Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Livingood. I'm the director of the Story Center at Midcontinent Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of three panels today for the eighth annual Local Author Fair. Normally, uh, we have this Local Author Fair at the Woodneath Library Center, which is where I'm broadcasting from right now, but last year and this year, we've uh, been able to repackage things into virtual format and we hope you enjoy today's uh, discussion. Um, we hope to be back in person next year. Today, we're featuring three authors and uh, who will be introducing your work. Uh, we'll be talking about their writing process. We'll be talking about uh, what kinds of projects they're working on. And those uh, authors are Jeff Burney, Lisa Rain, and MF Renee, and we're going to hear from each one of them and then come back from a general discussion. And I want to welcome you to ask any of your questions in the chat, and we'll make sure that we pull those into the conversation uh, after they've talked about their works. So again, uh, welcome to the 8th Annual Local Author Fair. And the first author we're going to hear from is Jeff Burney. Welcome, Jeff. Hello. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Jeff Burney. I'm an independent author. Uh, I write thrillers. Um, I guess I've been writing stories since I could hold a pencil. Um, hopefully they've, they've gotten a little bit better uh, over the years. Uh, they've definitely gotten a lot darker. For a long time, uh, honestly, writing was just a hobby, uh, but really deep down, uh, I never lost the desire to be an author. Um, I really love creating characters that spring to life from the page um, and um, constructing plots that leave readers thinking about my stories um, long after they're done uh, with the book. I wrote my first novel uh, just before I turned 40, which had been a, a, a long time goal of mine. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't really get specific with that goal. Um, I, it should have been, I wanna write a good novel before I turned 40. Uh, but it just wasn't any good. So I shelved it. Uh, it was definitely a learning process, um, but I didn't get up the nerve to to try again um, for another five years. And it took me two years uh, to write what became uh, A Killer Secret, which is a psychological thriller. Um, and this book is about the fact that we all have secrets. Um, you know, most of them are mundane. Um, and but some of them kind of define our lives uh, and others. Well, I thought maybe they just might be worth killing to keep. Uh, it is a pretty intimate story. Um, there are three main characters and they really are almost the only characters uh, in the book. Um, it is about uh, a disgraced professor um, who has moved to Kansas City from the East Coast um and feels like he has come down from the ivy league and is in purgatory in kansas city um and it's also about a disenchanted psychologist who works with and for this professor um she also happens to be um dating him and it's also about a deceitful patient um and honestly none of them are perfect characters. They all have flaws. And that's what I like to write. I, I try to write characters that feel real. Um, and so it's hard to tell who is the, the typical protagonist uh, in the book. And of course, they all have secrets. Um, I think it's a slow burning uh, book. It's dark. And I will warn you that uh, sometimes it's even a bit disturbing. But it does keep you guessing until the very end. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, our next author is Lisa Rain. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Mark. Thanks. And thanks to the Story Center for having me. Um, I write romance. Uh, so the book on your screen is my upcoming novel. Um, was originally set to release this December, right after the holidays, but with a little bit of the um, issues surrounding uh, getting supplies and um, 
things, the date has changed to April. So if you were originally thinking your copy would arrive in December, stay patient. It's going to be in the spring. I am a former practicing attorney. I practice entertainment, media, and entertainment law for a little over 20 years before I started writing. My first novels were contemporary romance. I am from Kansas City, so my novels were set in Kansas City. Um, the first and two different series, one about lawyers, no surprise there, right? Second series about a fictional football team because I'm a big football fan. So yes, go Chiefs Kingdom. And then this year I had the opportunity to work on a historical romance, which led me to Never Cross a Highlander, which is the story of a free army commander in medieval Scotland, so early 1600s, who has the secret double life where he goes around freeing captives, freeing slaves that are held across Scotland. And on one of his trips, he inadvertently interrupts a female slave who has an escape plan of her own. And he thinks he's helping her. She thinks he's meddling. So in essence, he ends up kidnapping her. And on their travels back to the Highland, we've got quite a bit of an interaction. So I like to describe this book as Dirty Harry and a Kilt meets Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So if you like action adventure and historical romance, this is the novel for you. Right. Thank you, Lisa. And our third author this morning is M.F. Renee. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. I'm so excited to be here. So my name is Marcy. One of my pen names is M.F. Renee, and I'm originally from Kansas City, but my life right now is lived across borders, across languages, and across cultures. Uh, I've been living abroad really since I was nine when I first uh, fell in love with France and the French language and culture. And then I went, I left Kansas City, went to France, met my French husband, and we've been living all over the world. We're back in Kansas City a lot, uh, but we've lived in France and Morocco and then most recently Spain. But I was just in Kansas City this summer, so it was wonderful to be back, back home for a while. But we have four boys and we've been working for an organization among immigrants and refugees for the past 20 some years. And most recently, I have gotten into the field of human trafficking. So working with women and children who are rescued victims. And that's what led me to write my most recent work, Our Journey to El Dorado. Um, it's the story of a Moroccan immigrant who came over searching for El Dorado, as many of the refugees do. They truly believe that on the other side of the sea um, lies a land with streets paved of gold, where uh, there's uh, riches and wealth and just a land of opportunity. And then they find often that it's just a, just a mirage, just an illusion. And oftentimes they find themselves trapped in situations, um, much more devastating circumstances than even what they had in their homeland. So this memoir is uh, really my journey uh, interwoven with uh, the story of this Moroccan woman. And it's a very um, raw and honest uh, story of, of a victim. Um, but there is a storyline throughout of hope and redemption and how even in our most devastating circumstances, uh, something beautiful can come uh, from pain and trauma. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my story and just looking forward to being here with you guys. Great, thank you. Uh, and again, welcome all. There, there was a, an additional author, C.A. Campbell, who was intending to intending to be part of this panel, but unfortunately couldn't join us. So I just wanted to mention that she's also a, a local author who, who would uh, feature uh, and hope that she can join us uh, next year. Um, so we have, again, questions. We have a, a number of things to talk about. We can talk about publishing. We can talk about the writing process. We can talk about tips uh, that you all will have for other people who are working on projects. And we also invite uh, the uh, people who are watching to uh, send their uh, questions in through the comments and we'll get to those too. But uh, I think one place we might want to start is 
is revisiting this issue of uh, inspiration. Now, I, I know some of you had mentioned that uh, in your opening remarks and your description of what you're, of the book you're uh, with here today, but what about, what if we think about any uh, more uh, questions or, uh, or about what inspired you to uh, write the book uh, that you are talking about this morning? Uh, I can go. Um, this sure. actually wasn't wasn't uh, going to be the next book I wrote. I had uh, an entirely other book outlined. Um, and then I read an article um, and it was so interesting to me. And it was about um, a man who was charged with being a serial killer uh, because he had um, admitted to what he had done to his his therapist. So he was arrested and charged and went through all of that only to find out that he was just a super lonely guy who um, ended up going to a therapist and he loved the fact that she listened to him and um, liked how she responded to his stories. And so he started making up more and more things so that um, he was as as he was trying to impress her um so this was this was a, a a true article it's not the the actual um plot of the book but that really kind of resonated with me you know how we all kind of put on this this face for other people um and and try to make ourselves more likable uh, and so I, I sat down and started thinking about that and, and the fact that we all have secrets um, and, and really that kind of helped interweave the book. I, you know, I get a lot of inspiration from news articles or even just um, conversations I overhear in a restaurant, you know, snippets of things. I kind of um, collect them all. I'm a collector of of other people's weird stories. And, th and then when I sit down and, and start to write a book, they kind of um they just bubble up and and it's it's interesting they seem to the right stories seem to bubble up at the right time and and help me kind of build something different from that thank you well and i will say for me um i was happy writing contemporary and then i'd actually taken a little time off for writing a um, lot of things were going on in the romance community and organizations were exploding and um, there was a lot of drama be behind who was getting published and who was writing what stories with diverse characters and um, they're not really coming from diverse authors. And at the time I was still working as a lawyer and solo parenting two children and the writing was just a little hard to keep up with. So when I decided, okay, I'm ready to go back and I'm gonna stay indie because I didn't want to end the drama, I ended up attending a conference with a publisher who specifically was looking for historical romance featuring diverse characters written by diverse authors. And at first I was silent and then she started talking about it. She wanted a cowboy book and I'm a cowboy fan. I, me and my grandmother grew up watching cowboy movies. Uh, that's probably why I'm a Clint fan. I was first a Clint spaghetti western fan before I was a Dirty Harry fan and she initially wanted the cowboy book and I transitioned into teaching language arts and African-American studies at the high school level. So the period of time she wanted for the cowboy book I knew because I taught it and I thought okay I can do the cowboy early to you know early 1900s late 1800s I can do that. Well, then she came back and said, well, you got another series in you, you know, could you come up with another series? What would you write? And I love Highlander romance. Highlander romance done well is one of my favorite historical genres. And I thought, and I said to her, you know, I love Highlander romance, but I've never ever read a romance with a black Highlander in it. I'd like to write one. And she was like, well, okay. And her first question, and it was funny, she says, Okay, were there blacks in Scotland during that 
time? And I'm like, yeah, they were there. Now, what exactly they were doing, I can't tell you because I'm a, I study the African diaspora, but she challenged me to come up with a story. And so that led me down this research path to come up with the story of a Highlander in medieval Scotland who was black. And sort of what Jeff said, my thought was, well, I know that there were blacks there, some free, some as slaves. What would happen if, right? I got this Highlander guy who went about trying to free them all. What what would that look like? And that's how I came up with Never Cross a Highlander. Yeah. How did you, uh, just a follow up question. How did you do that research then? What, what did you, what did you look at uh, to that historical research? Where did that lead you? I actually went initially to the early days of the slave trade with Africa. And I think a lot of people forget that it's the Europeans, the Portuguese, the Dutch, who first really started taking slaves out of Africa. And they went to Europe. So I went back to that research to see when they got to Europe or when European countries captured these slaves, what did they do with them? Where did they go? And found like in the early Americans, a lot of them went through the Caribbean first, right? Sugarcane, things like that. Well, a lot of European business interests at that time, they had Caribbean plantations. They were um, Dutch, especially were heavy into trying to get things like tea, um, other plantations where they were also trying to grow sugar cane and those things. And interestingly enough, which is where my story took me, is that pirates played a big role. And the blacks that ended up in Scotland, because what they would do is attack the Portuguese and Dutch slave ships as they were going around the continent. And they take all the cargo, including the slaves that were down in the basement, and they'd sell them to rich Europeans to use as servants. And it was seen as a status symbol. Right. I've got my right. My cool African servant. Aren't I cool? And I'm wealthy. And that sort of got me thinking, oh, slaves. Pirates, Highlanders, ooh, you're like, this could be really good. <laughs> so we got a little piracy in here too. Mm. Well, for me, I'll, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, All please. of my stories, I write, uh, you know, I write nonfiction. So all of my stories just come out of my life experiences. Since I was a little girl, I'm like you, Jeff. I you know, I've been writing stories since I could, I could hold a pen. It started in my journal and it was just stories about my life. And so all of my stories, like on my website, they're cultural stories that just, you know, stem from something I'm experiencing something I'm learning as I rub shoulders with people who are from totally different backgrounds and cultures than my own and just wanting to share those and, and build awareness. Uh, my children's books, um, all have come just inspired by my children's lives, my four boys, as they've lived across cultures and languages and borders. Um, you know, my children's books are about uh, children traveling and experiencing and learning from, from culture. Um, Mommy, What's a Safe House, one of my children's books, it was simply from a question that my seven-year-old son asked me when he knew I was going to the safe house every week. Mommy, What's a Safe House? And so as I explained, as I could, mother to child in a very, you know, kid-friendly, age-appropriate way, I just turned that heartfelt, true conversation into a children's book. So um, our journey to El Dorado was a little bit different because I didn't picture myself necessarily getting into um, the side of, you know, coming alongside rescued uh, victims of human trafficking, but I was called in for Arabic translation one day. And once I walked through the door, my heart broke and I, I couldn't walk out. Um, but as I listened to these women's stories and this particular woman in particular, and this particular Moroccan woman, I carried her story and it was such a heavy traumatic story that I just began writing more as therapy for myself. I just needed to get it out, um, you know, ease to paper. And as I began writing, I began feeling a very strong calling to, to be a voice for the silent ones. Her name is Habiba, and she represents the thousands and thousands of Habibas around the world. And so I went to her and I asked her permission to write her story. And she said, tell my story, tell them my story. And so I knew it was just an urgency and a, and a strong push to get her get her story out to be her voice. Mm -hmm. 
So an, uh, a follow-up question to that is that you, you, you talked about your inspiration for your book and what led you to write the book. So next question is about what's that process like? How do you go about turning that inspiration now into a book? Uh, is it, is it uh, as personal as a, you know, a routine? Is it more, you know, catch when catch can, how does that process work? You know, I'm okay. sure it's unique to everybody who, who sits down and, and tries to create something, but can you describe that process of, of taking an inspiration and actually getting words on, on the screen or on the page? I will say for me that it started out honestly as catch as catch can, because my first book, uh, <laughs> like I said, I was practicing law. I was solo parenting kids and I had one who was in four, uh, three sports at school and club volleyball and track and track during the spring and track in the summer. And so I often wrote when I could. And for me, it meant first thing in the morning, I'd get up and I'd write for about 45 minutes before my kids got up and we had to go to school or do any of that. Then I do my business stuff. And then in the afternoon, there was a short window before dinner where I could usually do something. A lot of times that was either editing what I wrote in the morning or, or doing a little plot, like where am I going from here? Um, and interestingly enough, I often would take my tablet with me to practices and games and I would be writing during practice or writing in the car while I'm waiting for some kid to come. So I wrote whenever I could and it was written in little gaps. And I think it's a fun story since I'm here with you guys. A lot of that first book was finished at the public library because there were times where I had to get away from the office space or away from the child space and I couldn't focus. So I would go to a branch of the Mid-Continent Public Library right. and do something. And the beauty of that is when I got stuck on something, the librarians knew I was writing and I said, oh, man, but I can't figure this out. And they go, oh, we got a book on that. Right. And they run, grab me this book. Um, and so for me, I've sort of learned to write when I can. I, I, mm -hmm. I My lifestyle has just been sort of catch as catch can. But mm -hmm. there's probably a small process in that is because I can write out of order. And I often have segmented time. I will go, oh, I've got 40 minutes. OK, I'm going to work on this particular scene. And it doesn't really have to be the next scene. But later, when you put it all together, voila, you have a book. Lisa, I, I can really relate to you because I'm there's nothing structured or methodical about my my process and i think it's also the season of life that you just alluded to i mean i have four kids mm. i have a full-time job i i talk to other writers who have like eight to nine hours a day and i'm like wow what would that be like um i i always say i write on the in the margins of my life and i brought this this uh i wanted to just show this nifty gadget because i learned mm. about this through Story Center, I was doing, I'm doing the storytelling, you know, certificate with Shannon and Shannon Thompson. And I learned about this. It's the Alpha Smart Neo 2 word mm. processor. You can only get them, you know, used on eBay. They cost like 25 bucks. It has changed my life because I stick it in my bag, my purse. It's always in my car or with me. And so I'm just like you, Lisa, you know, with four boys. I am always sitting in the car waiting, you know, for kids to come out of soccer. I get to school. I have five, 10 minutes and I, I can write in these little gaps and somehow it all comes mm -hmm. together. And I'm also a late night owl. I'm not an early bird like you that can write in the morning, but I put my youngest to bed by nine and from nine to 12, I go out, I have a little writing shack literally in my backyard. It's my little sacred writing space. And from nine to midnight, I know it sounds crazy, but I, I'm, in with a virtual writing group and for three hours we just bust it out and so that's my time and then it all comes together but other than that it might be five minutes here and ten minutes there and mm -hmm. somehow it comes together mm -hmm. is that every night that you do that from nine to twelve i try to do it about five times a week we've been, five we times were a doing, week. 
we were doing an hour and a half, but with NaNoWriMo, we've we've upped it mm. to three hours, which sounds mm -hmm. crazy. But we're being mm -hmm. we're very productive, and there's a synergy mm -hmm. when you're writing live with other writers. Wow! So mm -hmm. yeah, highly. So what, will you have a, a draft of another book by the end of November? <laughs> I actually have finished, I've never done NaNoWriMo, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, my first goal, I didn't know how long it was going to be. I felt like it was going to be a short memoir, but it's actually of my father. Um, it's My working title right now is The American Cowboy Who Crashes the French Wedding. So it's a, a true, true memoir with a lot of cultural humor, uh, but I wanted to write that in honor of my father. And it ended up being just short, like 25,000 words, my first draft. So I'm actually doing a couple couple of smaller projects for Nana. Mm -hmm. That's right. Wow. Great. How about you, Jeff? What's um, your process like? I'm going to sound like the crazy one now. Great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, I, I am like the two of you where I have to write in the margins of my life. We we have uh, not trying to one up anyone. We have seven kids, but only Ooh. only four of them live at home. Um, <laughs> I, I did write uh, my first book, A Killer Secret, in the evening. So I am definitely more of a mm -hmm. after everybody's in bed, it's quiet. I can get some work done, but um, I am definitely a planner. I I. I use Scrivener software, so mm. it's on my phone, it's on my tablet, it's on my computer, so I can. I've been, you know, in line at the grocery store and had an idea and 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 um, you know, written there. Um, I wish I was more like Lisa and could write out of order. Uh, my brain mm. just won't let me. Uh, mm. <laughs> I've got all the scenes listed out, and I definitely could write a later scene if I wanted to. It's just it 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 makes me shake. Uh, mm. <laughs> but uh, like I said, I am a planner. I, I don't start a story until I know how it ends. Um, I obviously don't want to write a story where everybody knows how it ends when I'm writing it, but I kind of need to know what's my North Star, where where are these characters going to end up so that I can start them at a place where they all grow um, if they survive. Um, <laughs> so I kind of, I use... I use something that I I discovered, and I, I, I'm also a researcher and a reader, so I've read all kinds of uh, what I call self-help books for independent authors, you know, the the how to write a novel kind of books. Um, and a lot of them have the same kind of things, but I stumbled upon one called the Snowflake Method. Mm. And I don't know, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's basically, you know, snowflakes are, they're, they're all unique, right? But they're all kind of created from smaller crystals, right? You build a snowflake from all these individual smaller crystals. And so the idea is you start with a one sentence um, synopsis of your, of your story. What is the idea in one sentence? And then you build that sentence into three to five sentences, and then you build it into, you know, three to five paragraphs. And then you, when you, you end up with like a three to four page kind of synopsis of here's your, here's your story. And from that, I kind of break it down into um, chapters and zine, scenes, because, you know, the biggest thing um, when I first started, you know, I told you I've always wanted to be an author and it's, it, you know, it seems like this beautiful romantic thing. And then you sit down at your computer and you're like, I have a hundred thousand words to write. Oh my goodness. Um, but it really has helped me to say, okay, well, I'm writing this chapter today mm -hmm. and it's got five scenes and this scene I kind of think is 5,000 words or whatever it is. So, okay, great. That's, that's easier for me just personally to, to comprehend. And it gives me those smaller goals along the way so that I feel mm -hmm. like I'm making progress. I wish I could write every day. I wish I could, um, I wish I had the, the kind of schedule, um, that allowed me to do that and that's another thing you know I, as i was researching how to be an author um you know it's like write every day write all the time which i love it when that works for people but it just didn't work for me for a long time i beat myself up about that you know and now it's more of a okay if i'm thinking about my book i'm moving it forward if i'm able to write a sentence today i'm moving it forward and um kind of the same thing with lisa i have my next book the fall of faith was supposed to come out in December. Well, it's not coming out in December. And that really made me anxious for a while. And I realized I'm an independent author. I don't have a publisher saying, you know, we're dropping you if you don't deliver. I'm putting the pressure on myself. Um, so that's kind of helped me 
kind of relax a little bit as a writer. And, and you mentioned the snowflake method. That's the title of the book that you found helpful? Um, yes, I think it's like how to write a novel with the snowflake method. It's Randy okay. um, Ingermanson, um, who's an engineer. So it definitely sounds like an engineer's way to write a novel. And I am not an engineer. I'm actually in advertising. So I write creatively for a living, but okay. I write, you know, 30 second commercials or, you know, a brochure, not a hundred thousand word okay. novel. And so it was a different right. beast for me. Yeah. How about the other two of you, MF and, and Lisa, have you found a particular resource helpful to you as you've worked on this project or other projects? Probably not this project, but it's one I found early in my writing career. Um, and it really set the stage for me. And it's called The First 50 Pages. And I think it's, is it Jeff Gerke who wrote it? Um, but that's the title, The First 50 Pages. And it talks about how if you're not going to grab your reader, right, and those first 50 pages, they're out, right? And so the importance of what that first 50 pages is for, how you set up your novel, how you introduce your characters, how you set up the promise of your story to really snag your reader. And I find that it applied really well um, to me as a reader because I read across genres. I love to read romance, but I also love to read thrillers. Um, and so I'm a big thriller fan. So Jeff, I got to go <laughs> pick up your book, by the way. I love thrillers. Um, Valdacci's one of my favorites. Um, I really love his Will Robbie series. And it forced me to go back and find those books I loved in each genre and just check out like the first 50 pages. And I went, ah, okay, that's what I've got to do if I want people really to love my books. So that's just writing specific, not romance specific. Um, if you're new to romance, I recommend a book called Romancing the Beat. And it takes the beat method of plotting, which is really a motion picture type um, system, but maps out what those beats look like in a traditional romance novel. Um, and I don't completely use her, her series because I'm more of a save the cat person, um, MF or Jeff, you know, save the cat, the famous filmmaker. But she sets up a system where she says a romance starts where the main character is wholehearted with H-O-L-E like has a hole in their heart. So there's something wrong, something broken. They got to grow, as Jeff was saying, they got to grow. Then there's the part where they start falling in love. And then there's usually something that goes wrong, right? And they're going to retreat from love because now we're thinking how are they ever going to stay together. And then by the end, they're wholehearted, W-H-O-L-E, because they've resolved it, they've done this. And she helps walk you through that structure. And I think that's fabulous for anybody, especially if you're new to romance, it just makes it really clear to understand what the plot looks like. And so I highly recommend that, especially for newbies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm still a newbie because I um, am a new author. It's just been this past year. It sounds crazy, but to start it in February of this year and have published five books, kind of a rapid release method, but they were, you know, kind of in process. It was just, I always say I'm a writer who's come out of the closet recently because I've been writing, you know, kind of underground, hidden in my little secret place and, and finally felt like maybe it's time to to launch my words. So I'm just on a major learning curve and learning mm -hmm. from everybody that I can. But I mean, just like, honestly, the quote by Stephen King from his book on writing, you know, it's this idea of butt in chair every day. Mm -hmm. So I always mm -hmm. say, okay, as long as like you were saying, Jeff, even if all you can get out is a sentence, right? But if your butt's in the chair, at least for, you know, those few minutes each day, you are, you're moving it forward. Um, again, my, my passion is you know, nonfiction and memoir. So I have learned so much from Marion Roach Smith, uh, the memoir pro project, if anybody um, is interested in memoir. And this is, it's this idea, it's such a paradigm shift because we're not talking about autobiography, you know, of your entire mm -hmm. life, but it's about curating your life. It's about taking, you know, these little pieces of your, your life. Like I just mentioned, you know, writing this piece, this very short memoir piece about my father and our, our French wedding. So it's taking just a, just a, a part of my entire life and writing a memoir. So it's it's just fascinating. So I've learned so much from her. 
Um, Jeff Goins as well um, is someone that I that I've followed and have learned so much just through his podcast and through his books. Joanna Penn, she has a great mm -hmm. uh, podcast, The Creative Pen, just incredible, and um, just different uh, different writers and writing groups. Uh, Kat Caldwell has pencils uh, and lipstick podcast, but she also has this live creative writing community or um, Joseph, I don't know if you guys know Joseph Michael, he's like the Scrivener mm -hmm. coach. I've learned everything about Scrivener from him, but he has again, kind of this online writing community called Unchained Writers. And it's just, that's changed my life. Those kinds of resources, rubbing shoulders with other writers, having an opportunity to learn, ask questions, from writers that are a little bit further along than I am who become like writing, writing mentors to me. I can go to them with questions. They helped me, many of them, know just the, the next step to take in the self-publishing journey. I was clueless. And so I've just learned from, from those who've walked the road ahead of me. Great. Those are all great resources. Uh, people ask us all the time. So it's nice to, to uh, know what, what resources you all have found helpful. Um, I want to circle back to something, pick up on something that Lisa mentioned uh, early on, and that was uh, about staying indie, I think you, you said. And so I'm hoping that we could talk about publishing because there, we know now that there are all kinds of different publishing models and options. And be interested in, in hearing your thoughts on, you know, what, what, how you went about uh, thinking about publishing your book and, and what was the best fit and, and how you pursued that. Uh, should I start? I, sure. I, I initially started the journey thinking I was going traditionally published, but with my legal background in intellectual property and understanding IP assets and how that worked, um, what was being offered for authors, especially in a newbie romance writer world, I didn't feel like the value of what I was getting on the offer contracts warranted giving away my copyrights at that point in time. And I knew it'd be a journey before I became a big name author. I had big sales, but holding on to those copyrights instead of giving it away for chump change was something I decided early on made more sense for me because I wasn't afraid to learn the business. I already knew a lot of the legal aspect. So then I just had to figure out the business of being an indie author. And I wasn't afraid of that. And it made sense for me to write several books that way. Where it changed when I came back, um, because Marcy talks about being at a different point in your life. Well, last year, my second my second child went off to college. So now I've got less mothering time in the evening and more time to dedicate to this. And I mapped out what I wanted and I wanted a broader reach that I didn't think I could do since I still was not full time writing. But I was very careful about who I wanted to go with. So I entered into a contract for these historicals because for me, I had never thought about writing historicals. So I didn't feel like I was giving anything away. And I went with a smaller company started by a woman, Liz Pelletier, run primarily by women. And their goal is to help their authors make as much money as possible using business strategy. She's an entrepreneur and I'd work with entrepreneurs. So I'm now in a hybrid space, but I felt the value of what Entangled Publishing, who's, who's doing Never Cross a Highlander, what they were offering me was worth giving up that little bit of share of copyright to work with them. But mm -hmm. they work in a way that works for me. Like you have to find your fit. I think so many authors just want to be traditionally published and they sign a contract with anybody and then they're not happy. But this is a partnership and, and these are your babies. Like you sweat long enough to get these words out. You want the right people handling your babies, right? Mm -hmm. And so I took the time to find people I loved being with and had the same philosophy on business as I did. Um, I don't know that I just would have done this with anyone. I don't think I would have. I think I would have continued to be straight indie instead of hybrid. So I will release my contemporary stuff will continue to be released as indie. And then the historicals I'm going to release through Entangled. 
So you, you're doing both. You're, I'm doing both now. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about the others? I love that. Um, I, um, I've always been kind of an, an entrepreneur. I've, you know, I've started and run my own um, ad agency at, at, at the point of previous point in my life. Um, and I plan on being an independent author. Um, that was kind of my goal from the beginning. Uh, like I said, I'm a planner. I did a lot of research. Now that said, if someone comes to me and gives me Stephen King money, I'm not going to turn it down. But, <laughs> but after looking at the industry, I mean, if you really do look at it, um, for all for every Stephen King, there's thousands of authors who toil in obscurity or near obscurity, even though they're traditionally published. Right? If you don't earn back your um, the, the upfront money they give you. And if you're not Stephen King, it's very little, you're not going to get a second chance with that publisher. Mm -hmm. And so for me being in advertising, I figured, okay, I can market my book probably better than someone who has hundreds of other books that they're trying to market. Um, and who isn't as passionate about my work. Um, and I really sat down and thought, okay, what is a publisher for someone who's just starting out? what does a publisher really bring to you? And, and, and to me, the research that I did, they don't really bring a whole lot, right? The, they bring reach, but mm -hmm. as, but as an unnamed author, that reach isn't a whole lot. And so if I can be patient, I can start to build that myself now, knowing that it'll be a slower process, but I'll be in control. Um, and then I can guide that. So, you know, I have a business plan. I have, uh, you know, a five, 10, 15 year plan for where I want to take this business. And that's how I've always treated it. This is, I'm, I'm creating art, but it's also a business. And, and so that's how I've, I've seen it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I chose the self publishing route ma mainly as a sense of urgency, I think, um, mm -hmm. You know, when I talked to other writers just in the beginning of the process, I had no idea even where to start. But I can remember someone saying, you know, if you go the traditional route, it could be two to three to five years before your book's on a, on a shelf. And I just remember thinking, wow, you know, life is so short. I have so many books that I, you know, so many ideas and projects in mind. Like, so there was that sense of urgency just, just for myself. And then for uh, the, the works I did, you know, our journey to El Dorado, uh, this story of, you know, this, this rescued victim, and then the children's book that accompanies it, Mommy, What's a Safe House, as an educational resource, I just felt like there is an urgency to tell these stories. And I can just remember when this Moroccan woman said, tell them my story, I just felt like, now, tell them my story. And as I started looking, you know, human trafficking is not just a, a hot topic that's happening here in Europe. It's all over the world. When we were back in the States this summer and in Kansas City, I can remember first day at my mom's house, she puts on the table the front cover of the Kansas City Star. Mm -hmm. And I just remember there was this huge sex trafficking ring that had been you know, broken up multiple suburbs, including my hometown, Independence. And I thought, wow, it's right here at our doorstep. These are topics we have to start talking about. And so again, just that sense of urgency that it's now, this is a, this is a right now message that has to get out. We've got to talk about it. Maybe in five years, probably, I hope not, but there's a chance we're still going to be talking about it, but right now. And so I, I didn't want to wait. I also wanted to be more in control. Maybe it's part of my personality, but I just wanted mm -hmm. to be part of that whole process and, and know where my message, where my word, how it was getting out. But Jeff, I need to pick your brain on how to market because as a self publisher, oh my goodness, you've got so many hats to wear. So I love writing and producing, you know, creating content. But then I can remember, I got these books published and my friend said, well, if you don't tell anybody that you have these books, no one will know. And I was like, oh, really? I'm ready to just move on to the next project. But there's that whole marketing hat you've got to put on. So, oh boy, I'm uh, trying to learn how to do that. And uh, certainly would love love some pointers from, from you who walked the road ahead of me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, great. I think we're going to, I, 
I want to uh, invite people to send their questions into the, the comments on, on Facebook and we'll relay those to the author. And I think we'll also take a little couple seconds here to, uh, to picture your books again, just to remind everybody where they can see the titles and then also the websites of, of where they can find out more about you as an author, but also uh, your book that you're working on currently and uh, or the book that you, this book, but also the book more about uh, other books that you've, you've worked on. And that kind of leads to the next question that I have. It's like, and some of you have talked a little bit about this, like Marcy, you talked about this as your nano project, but uh, uh, what are you working on now? Well, I, I well, I mentioned that one, but I'm I'm constantly writing stories. I probably write a short cultural story every day, just because I mean, in my context, like I'm not lacking for content and ideas. Uh, so just just short stories that I post on my you know my website regularly. Um, I'm the type of writer that probably personality too. I'm not just working on one project at a time. I've got my hand in like multiple pots. It's probably to my detriment, but um, like I've got a couple of, you know, children's stories that are, that stories are written. I just need to pass those on to, to the illustrator and kind of start that process. Um, this, the children's books that I have written now, we are wanting to, to use those for a broader audience, but also um, as educational resources, like here in Spain and in France, we're trying to get some of those translated into French and Spanish. So that's kind of another another part of the process uh, for me with you know different languages. And then uh, just a couple of um, really exciting kind of long term works, but um, compilation of short stories. So a collection of stories of of women who have been rescued out of human trafficking. Another one, a compilation of collected stories of some of the refugees and immigrants that we've worked through, worked with the past 20 some years, just these displaced diaspora people who are on the move. Um, and so those kind of an interesting project it will be with uh, one of my incredible artist friends. She's a professional artist um, from Canada, Kim Peters. And it'll be short stories, but coupled with some really awesome art. So kind of a different project and super excited about that. So lots of things. I just, I get bored, I think with, and it's weird because I'll be writing like, for example, when I was writing our journey to El Dorado, it was a very heavy, heavy story. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time I was writing this book of you know, a compilation of short stories called language learning laughs, because I think it was my way of, of, you know, entering into a whole nother world of humor, true stories, um, but but humor. And I think I, I needed that to kind of balance the heaviness of, of this other piece. So a variety. <laughs> and I'm working on a historical cowboy novel. Um, my publisher actually wanted the cowboy novel first, but given the nature of the research and being a little paranoid <laughs> about getting things wrong. I'm like, look, I really need more time to figure out this sort of medieval Scotland thing. So now I'm I'm working on finishing up the historical cowboy, which has more of a romantic comedy flair. So if you, you know, think roman uh think cowboy stories like uh, Silverado, I'm dating myself here, which is a little, you know, cowboy, uh, support your local sheriff. So it's a cowboy story, but it has kind of that comedic edge to it. And it's the story of um, a bounty hunter um, who is trying to retire and he's decided he's retiring to this small, no place uh, town in Kansas Plains and think, you know, it's a small town. Nobody knows who he was. Nothing ever bad happens. And then a woman comes to town who's inherited the local saloon, um, only to find out there's a little bit more than saloon going on at the location. And she's this prim, proper Eastern lady who sort of turns things up that upside down there, which then makes chaos break out in the town. And he's got to sort of wade in. And it's frustrating him because he's trying to hang up his guns, do some whittling, you know, 
raise some horses. And so it's just sort of that funny interaction between them two. So that's really going to be fun. And then for myself, I, I put on the shelf and I'm dying to do it now. Um, one of my series is about, it's called International Love Games and it's athletics, but it's it centers on female athletes who go to like uh, the Olympics or the World Games and they find love. So the first in the series was set during uh, the Beijing Olympics and it was a track star and this love triangle with a swimmer and a uh, Australian swimmer and a Brazilian runner. And I have this story about an American figure skater who becomes part of an ice dancing pair and is trying to make it to the Winter Olympics. And so I'm hopeful I'll get my traditional deadline out of the way so I can finish the book about the ice dancers in time for the end of the Winter Olympics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I, I wish I um, wrote as fast uh, as the two of you. Um, <laughs> I take a while on my projects. Um, but that's also something that I've I've realized and worked on that uh, you can't compare yourself as an author to, to anyone else because we're all different. Um, still, I wish I was faster. Um, <laughs> so I'm almost finished with um, the first draft of my next novel. Uh, I think I mentioned it's called The Fall of Faith. Um, it's kind of an exploration of, of our faith uh, in ourselves, uh, in others, uh, in whatever God we choose to, to recognize. And it's about you know whether or not we can change before it's too late and what happens if we lose that faith are we able mm -hmm. to to find it again um my and it's a domestic thriller it's interesting you know i i always gravitate towards these really kind of deep topics but then i wrap them in the the thriller kind of genre um because those are what things I think about, and then thrillers are the things that I like to read. Um, the other thing I'm working on is I'm I am uh, currently recording the audiobook version of A Killer Secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you reading that yourself? I am. Mm -hmm. Unless you guys don't think my voice is nice, and then and then I'll scrap the whole thing. <laughs> you actually have a great voice, so I could totally yeah. see you. Doing the this. thriller, I, really right on. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, I was curious because we do, we do at the Story Center have people who want to produce audiobooks, but based on things they've written, and and I'm always curious if they are doing that themselves or if, if they have other people read for them. We've had both. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I work in advertising, so I've worked with production companies and I've done audio productions. I've also done mm -hmm. a little bit of VO, and so I thought, you know what, I'll I'll try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But mm -hmm. never know unless you try. Yeah, and that's so we have money a, you don't have to share, Jeff. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Shannon Thompson. Uh, there it is. What was the most surprising thing you learned while writing? Ooh. Um, to me, uh, never having written uh, a novel before, um, well, like I said, I wrote a bad one, but then as I'm writing A Killer Secret, you know, I kind of fleshed out these characters. The most surprising thing to me, I'm a planner, but I kind of leave room to improvise as I go. And it really surprised me how my characters would just do things that I didn't plan for. It's really weird. You know, I know they're not real, but it's like, oh man, that's cool. I didn't think about that when really... I clearly did think about that. I wrote mm -hmm. it, but it's it it comes from a deeper place. I'd agree with that. I I don't want to to duplicate the answer, but I'd heard writers talk about that even before I wrote a book. Oh, my characters just sort of take over, and I'm thinking, yeah, whatever. You're right, right? But even even in this Highlander book, especially, there was a direction I thought I was going. And in the scene, I'm going and she starts to do something like, no, she and no matter how much I wanted to go away from it, I, I really finally had to listen to her voice and write it that way. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, no, I should have done it the other way. And then I get to the last act of the novel and I'm writing and I'm writing and I go, oh, that's why she did that. And it's totally the right thing. But that's not what I was going to do. I really feel like my character entice me based off of who she was to to go down that story direction and it is like just it's weird because sometimes you want to fight them but i've learned to listen to that voice because it's usually right mm. 
And for me, I would say the most surprising thing was how much I learned about myself as I wrote. And again, I'm in my story, so I realize it's it's a very different, you know, type of uh, type of process. But uh, just the discovery as I was writing just about about my life, just the illumination of of who I am came out on paper and would sometimes surprise me. I think the other thing that comes to mind, this is more about the process, but I had no idea what went into a book, like how much work. And I will, I'll just use the example of a children's book. Oh my, <laughs> I had no idea the work behind that little, you know, thin picture book with, you know, 500 words in it. But uh, there's so much more than just the story when you get into the formatting. Again, as a self-publisher, I was doing all the formatting on my mm -hmm. own and that learning curve. But wow, um, I just, I think when I finished the project, could stand back and, and just admire all those authors, just not whether it be, you know, a full book piece as, as we've done or a children's book. Wow, just full admiration for the work that's behind uh, that piece. So it surprised me big time. <laughs> so we have time for uh, one more question that I have uh, before we wrap up. And that is, uh, what are you reading? What are you reading currently? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't read a lot when I'm writing. Um, at least I don't read the same genre when I'm writing. So right now I'm reading... Um, the complete biography of Mark Twain. Um, it's it's by uh, Albert Bigelow Payne. Uh, it's a very detailed biography. It's a lot more detailed than I thought it would be, but it's super interesting. Um, Mark Twain's stories have fascinated me since I was a kid. Um, and just, he's a literary inspiration for me now because of his ability to connect with his readers um, and create these colorful, believable, and very flawed characters. And that's kind of what I try to do also. I don't want a perfect character in any of my, in any of my stories. Mm -hmm. Lisa? Um, I'm actually gone nonfiction. I actually do read a lot of romance right before mm -hmm. I start a romance book to sort of get me in the mood. But um, as an African-American studies teacher and like Jeff, I'm addicted to business books and self-improvement books and that happens. But I've been wanting to read The Black Count, um, which actually is a nonfiction book. And it's about the um, father of Alexander Dumas, who wrote The Three Musketeers. And I love that book and I love that novel. And I just wrote about the Highlander, which is sort of that period in a different country. So I finally pulled it off the shelf and now I'm reading uh, The Black Count, which is nonfiction, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, check that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, just like I'm writing all over the place, <laughs> I'm reading all over the place too. I always have a stack of books, you know, on my desk or, or by my bed. I, I might be personality. I get a little bored. I like variety. So I kind of dabble in everything and have a hard time sometimes reading cover to cover. Um, my favorite book in the world is the Bible. I read it every day and it never grows stale. It's just always fresh and new. Um, children's books. My eight-year-old, when he comes home from school, you know, with his after library day, I don't know who's more excited, but I can't wait to just read those and devour. I love children's books and, um, and short stories. I picked up, um, it's the modern English short stories. It's this old book. I found it in a used bookstore here in Spain, but these old short stories, and I love short stories. Maybe it's attention span. I don't know, but I like these little nuggets that from start to finish, you know, you can read a great story, full story in, in a matter of minutes. So always dabbling in, in lots of different books. <laughs> great. Well, I, we've come to almost to the end of our time together, but I'd like to uh, thank you all for being here and uh, sharing your your work and ideas and thoughts about the process and publishing and everything with us. And maybe, uh, Gennard, as we, as we end, we can uh, revisit the, the books that they are, uh, have, are featuring here today as well as their websites. And then uh, any last thoughts that you want to, uh, to mention on the way out, uh, please do. Jeff? Uh, just thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. I've had a, a lot of fun uh, and I have new books to read. Uh, 
Thank you, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> and Maria. Um, I, uh, you can find my book uh, anywhere that you can buy books online. So appreciate it. Great. Well, thanks for being here today. And I'd like Lisa? to say thanks for the invitation. This has been fun. Definitely pre-order my uh, Never Cost a Highlander. But if you don't want to wait till April, you can pick up Counselor Undone, which is my first mm -hmm. novel set in Kansas City and quarterback Casanova about the Kansas City Griffins. They're um, in Olathe. That's where their, their stadium is so that we're not in Chiefs territory. But again, set in Kansas City. And we're in football season, so it'll give you something to do. And then I'll give you some really exciting stuff to read in the spring. Hmm. And I Great. just want to thank Story Center. I alluded to it earlier uh, as a resource, but I have learned so much. I'm enrolled right now in the, the written and oral storytelling certificate hmm. programs. Shannon does an incredible job at bringing in these experts. I have learned mm -hmm. so much. So as a, as a new author, that has been my go-to. So I sign up for every workshop I possibly can. And when I'm on this side of the ocean, I stay up in the, into the wee mm -hmm. hours of the night because it is excellent. I cannot recommend it uh, more highly. So thank you, Story Center. And go Kansas City. <laughs> I love uh, my hometown. <laughs> good feedback. Thanks for that. Um, we certainly want to... Uh, invite people to take a look at, at the programs that we have coming up on the Story Center website. And if you go on our website, you'll also find uh, more information or links about this year's local author fair uh, to these three uh, authors here this morning and their links to their individual websites where you can uh, look more at, at their books and, and uh, purchase their books. And also the other authors who are participating in the other two panels, which are coming up later today, one uh, at 11, uh, 1230 and then another one at uh, 230. So we invite you back for that. And got a couple of comments here uh, from Janice. Love listening to all of these three amazing authors, also different and interesting. So much talent. Can't wait to read all three of these featured books. Really enjoy this fair. Thanks to all of you. And then uh, one from Kathy. Thank you. I really enjoyed getting to know these authors and their processes. Uh, go Casey. So <laughs> again, thanks all for being here and, and, and thank you everybody who uh, joined and watched the broadcast and we hope you'll uh, check out the story center and, and we hope to see you soon. So take care. Bye. Enjoy the rest of